Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight, the editor of Spiked, Brendan O'Neill, whose latest collection of essays is called A Duty to Offend. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasurer, Kelly O'Dwyer. The Federal Leader of the Greens, Richard Di Natale. American traditional marriage advocate, Katie Faust. And the Chair of the Senate Inquiry into Corporate Tax Avoidance, Labor's Sam Dastiari. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. We'll go straight to our first question in the audience from uh, Carla Stacey. Royal commissions are extremely powerful bodies uh, with the power to compel evidence and recommend police action. Given their extraordinary powers and huge costs, don't you think it's essential that they be above politics? Sam Dastiari. Yes, and I think the um, Royal Commissioner should resign his post. Well, the ACTU has until Thursday to make a <coughs> submission um, to ask him to stand down. Why have they waited so long? Look, um, that's really a matter for them. I can't answer questions on what decisions they do or don't want to take. But let's, let, the fact is this. The Royal Commissioner accepted an invitation to attend a Liberal Party event while he was conducting a Royal Commission into that political party's political opponents. Frankly, as far as I'm concerned, that disqualifies him and he should resign. You presumably heard what he said today. Um, he overlooked the fact uh, that this was a Liberal Party event. It was well, no, I think he says that when he initially took it, he thought after that point in time when he would be attending the event, he wouldn't still be conducting the Royal Commission. Uh, but look, you know, you can call it what you want. You can call it bias, you can call it perceived bias, you can call it uh, any number of different things. The fact is, his position is untenable. The Royal Commissioner, uh, Dyson Hayden, should be resigning. Kelly O'Dwyer. Well, look, I think that this has been a, a really pretty outrageous slur on somebody who is an eminent jurist. It was very clear in the statement he made today that he overlooked the fact that it was a Liberal Party event. Uh, he immediately <coughs> said that he would not attend that event nor speak at that lecture. Let's not forget that the lecture he was asked to speak at was the Sir Garfield Barwick lecture. And that lecture was a lecture of another eminent jurist. So I think it was quite understandable that he thought that he was delivering a law lecture uh, from one eminent jurist to another. But let's not distract from the fact that this is a Royal Commission that has not been set up, uh, as, as Sam has suggested, to be some sort of political witch hunt. It's a Royal Commission that is looking at very, very serious matters. It's looking at thuggery and intimidation and corruption within the construction sector, we have already seen people who have <coughs> given evidence at the Royal Commission arrested after having given evidence outside the front doors of the Commission, arrested for things such as bribery. We have heard evidence given about the fact that one particular union official was paid $93,000. Uh, by a superannuation fund. Uh, we've heard much, much evidence uh, along these lines and it's very, very serious. Kelly, uh, so I'm just going to pause you there for a moment because uh, I want to get you to react, your reaction to something. The uh, CFMEU, one of those unions under the spotlight in that Royal Commission, has had time to put together an attack ad. Um, let's have a quick look at it now. Tony Abbott will do anything to attack his critics. So he set up what he told us was an independent Royal Commission into unions. Yet the man he handpicked to head it up also agreed to be the headline act at a Liberal Party fundraiser. Independent, Mr Abbott? Honestly. OK, Kelly O'Dwyer, let's get... I mean, that's going to start going up tomorrow, as we understand it, so uh, your reaction... Well, I can, see, I can see why they would want to attack the Royal Commission, because the CFMEU, of course, uh, induced... Uh, a, a particular superannuation fund, CBUS, to provide personal and private details of 300 of their members. Now, that is completely outrageous. That's some of the evidence that's been given to the Royal Commission. I can see why it is that they don't want us to hear more about what has been going on. Um, Richard Di Natale. Oh, look, the Royal Commission was set up as a union bashing exercise. It was pretty transparent at the time. You've got um, the fellow who's heading the Royal Commission now attending Liberal Party fundraisers, if it's not biased, it's just really poor judgement and that should disqualify him in and of itself. Um, it was a deliberate uh, ploy by, by the government. It, this government does this sort of stuff. It, it plays politics all the time with these sorts of issues. If there's criminality um, within the union movement, well, charge them. 
You know, that's why we have laws. So if somebody's guilty of a criminal offence, they should be charged and they should be prosecuted. And the Royal Commission's find evidence presented to police and then the police look at whether charges are possible. That's the process we're going through. That's pretty typical in Royal Commissions, isn't it? It is typical, but um, what we know is, is that there are all these sorts of allegations floating around. We've got a Royal Commissioner who's got, who has links to the Liberal Party. He's now uh, he's been found out accepting fundraisers to Liberal Party events. I mean, it makes a mockery of, of the independence of the process. And it's a problem with this stuff. The politics always gets in the way of getting a decent outcome. And so you end up with, if there is an issue within the union movement, I think obviously the current government uh, play that for all it's worth, well, find those people who are guilty of it, charge them and have them tried before the law. I'll just go back to Kelly O'Dwyer because I don't think you ever really answered the initial question. I mean, should there be a higher standard for royal commissioners? Uh, as the questioner asked, given their extraordinary powers and huge costs, uh, isn't even more important they be seen to be above politics? Well, well, of course, and I think that Dyson Hayden is above politics. I mean, he's made a very, very clear statement. I think we are seeing politics being played by both the Labor Party and, dare I say it also, the Greens, because the Greens are the recipients of much union funding in the political donations that they do receive. So it's no surprise to me to hear that they're also attacking the Commission. It is very serious, a Royal Commission. It does uncover behaviour that is absolutely wrong in our community. But and should, the, should a Royal community. Commissioner be held to much higher standards precisely because of the powers that he or she has? Uh, they should be held to an incredibly high standard and I think that there is nothing that has been presented here that suggests that somebody of the unimpeachable reputation of Dyson Hayden, who has served in the High yeah. Court, who has had an unimpeachable career, there is nothing to suggest to me that he should not be allowed to continue on conducting the very important role that he is conducting right now. Brendan O'Neill, how does this look to you? Uh, I have to say, Australia, this is a really rubbish scandal. I mean, mm -hmm. I, when I got here, everyone was saying there's this huge scandal involving a Royal Commissioner, the Prime Minister, <laughs> trade unions, and I was like, yes, something to sink my teeth into. <laughs> And then I read it and I was like, are you serious? So in, in a nutshell, this guy accepted an invitation to speak at a dinner and he said, I won't speak if it's a fundraiser. Someone said to him, it is a fundraiser. And he said, OK, I won't speak at it. That's it. I mean, there are no prostitutes, there's no, there are no drugs, there's not even any booze, and booze is like the bottom line requirement for any kind of political Sorry. scandal. Yeah. And uh, so I think it's, it's a really lame scandal. It's, it's the fact that it's on the front page is the fact that the Fairfax media are having kind of paroxysms of joy over this nonsense. Did you say really no speaks... booze if you've never been to a Liberal Party fundraiser? <laughs> well, yeah. But it really speaks to a bigger problem, which is this infernal sleazemongering amongst the political and media elite, where they are constantly looking for scandal, even where it doesn't actually exist. I think it's a, it's a product of the tyranny of personality politics, where politicians are now judged more for how they behave, who, are the, who they're friends with, who they have lunch with, rather than for what their ideology is or what their contribution to public life is. There's this myopic obsession with people's personal behaviour, and I think it's really destructive of politics. My own view of royal commissions is we should get rid of them. Who are these people who are above <laughs> politics? Who, you know, how dare you be above politics? Nothing in public life is above politics. Who are they? You know, are they saints? Did Jesus send them to talk to us? You'd want, but, Brendan, you'd want a royal commissioner to be above politics, wouldn't no, you? No, I don't I mean... want a royal commissioner, and I don't want these oh. quangos and these investigations into people who, who get gifts of bottles of wine. Tell all the people or... who've suffered from childhood sexual abuse... And I don't, want, in... not, and don't want inquiries necessary. into child sexual yes, abuse. I don't want inquiries into domestic violence. <laughs> it, it, Issues of public life should be dealt with by officials who have been elected into public life. We need to scrape away this quangocracy, which is suffocating honest, genuine debate and giving okay. rise precisely to this kind of I'm going to go back to. Uh, thanks. I'm going to go back to uh, Sam Dassiari to respond to that. I mean, um... there's so much there to respond to in one kind of brief kind of thing. Look. Um, I think there is a role for Royal Commissions and I think the Child Sex Abuse Royal Commission has done a stellar job in uncovering some of the horrible practices that have gone on uh, and the child... We're talking here now about the horrible practices that have gone on in sections of the union movement which have been exposed by this Royal Commission. I think my concern from this Royal Commission from the start 
is it was a political exercise set up by this government to go after its political opponents. If there are legitimate concerns about elements of the trade union movement, they should be explored uh, and they need to be explored through the police. My concern about this Royal Commission from the start, and my real issue is, I, I see it a little bit as kind of this uh, Americanisation of our political process, where you have these quasi kind of judicial processes that get set up to go after different people's political opponents. And that is the dangerous path we're starting to go down. John Howard called it for what it was. Uh, you know, I find it hard when people like me sit on shows like this and reminisce about John Howard and actually remember it as kind of being the, the good old days. That was what becomes quite worrying. But <laughs> um, John Howard called it out for what it was. And this is an attack on political opponents. We haven't really had that culture in this country. I don't want to see us go down that path. Now, Katie Faust, uh, tough for you. Um, only just arrived in the country. But yeah. have you followed this story at all? Um, well, for somebody that's still getting used to the idea that liberals support traditional marriage, uh, because in my country, <laughs> that's not really how it goes. Um, this, to me, looks a little bit like, um, you guys have an expression, a storm in a teacup. You know, like a lot made out of not much. So, uh, but, I, but of course, you know, far be it for me to try to understand the inner workings of a government that I've only, you know, viewed from the outside for a week or so. Let's go to some questions that you probably know a little more about um, in detail. Uh, first question is from Ginny Deacon. There was no referendum to ask whether it was legal for my mums to have a baby. There was no plebiscite when the law changed to allow me to have two mothers listed on my birth certificate. So why should there be a referendum or plebiscite on whether my mums can get married? Richard Di Natale, we'll start with you. <laughs> simple answer is that Parliament should deal with it. Tony Abbott had a chance to drag the country into the 21st century and end discrimination, uh, to end prejudice, and he used every tactic in the book to block it, to continue to support prejudice and discrimination in marriage, uh, to not recognise that the love between two people is love, regardless of their gender or their sexuality. He stacked his party room with national MPs. Uh, he's now come up with this tortured position, it might be a plebiscite, it might be a, a referendum. No, we just should have the parliament deal with this. We could have this done so quickly. We could have this done this week. We could have a bill before the parliament, supported by a majority of parliamentarians. If Tony Abbott did what he espouses, and that, and that is to respect the freedom and liberty of his own uh, backbenchers and allow them a free vote. And he won't do it. He won't do it. And it's part of the reason that he is languishing in terms of public support because he is a man stuck in the past, he belongs to another century, and the sooner the, the Liberal Party change the Prime Minister, uh, I think the country will be better for it. Richard, aren't you, um, from your point of view, um, at all nervous in, in, in advocating that, at all nervous about the fact, given the numbers of the coalition party room, um, just on the conscience vote issue, aren't you nervous that it wouldn't have gotten up in the parliament anyway? No, I think it, would, it will get up. And I think there are a lot of MPs who do what they do in that place, and that is sniff the breeze. Uh, there'll be a lot of nervous backbenchers who will be worried about uh, winning their seats back at this election under Tony Abbott, and they'll go where the political breeze takes them. And on this issue, the public are overwhelmingly in support of ending discrimination, just move on and do it. I don't understand how we can be here in the 21st century mm. arguing for a position that is based on prejudice. Can I say, just just one quick question, though, on the referendum <coughs> thing. That is, the Irish uh, did have a referendum um, and that was widely celebrated in this country once the <coughs> result came out <coughs> pro-gay marriage. Why not have a refer referendum here? Well, we shouldn't have a referendum because that deals with the Constitution. You, you don't need to mess around with the Constitution on this issue. We've said, look, if, if the Prime Minister is absolutely hell-bent on a plebiscite, uh, and that's the only way we're going to get this reform through, then it has to be at this election, and it has to be the Parliament that sets the question. Right. Because he will engineer this in a way that it doesn't get up, much like the referendum that we had uh, as you remember, on the Republic. Mm -hmm. We can't let the Prime Minister make a captain's call on this. Uh, I just think we should have a vote of the Parliament. We could get it done so quickly right. and move on. Let's hear from Kelly O'Dwyer. You would have favoured a vote in the Parliament, wouldn't you, originally? Well, it's, it's no secret that I have long advocated same-sex marriage. I think I was one of the third parliamentarians on my side of politics to 
make public statements in 2013. Um, and, and, and the truth is, I, I would have favoured a free vote, and that's the position that I articulated in the party room, because I think that we are the party that can, in fact, allow their members to make a decision based on their own conscience. I think that is very much the tenets of our Liberal philosophy. It's the basis on which Robert Menzies founded the party more than 70 years ago. However, I listened to my colleagues in what was a six-hour party room meeting. And that meeting really allowed every member who wanted to speak on this issue an opportunity to speak. I spoke, and I spoke very forcefully <laughs> on this issue, and a number of my colleagues also spoke, and they, they were in favour of the traditional definition of marriage. Now, I do respect that they have a different view to mine, and I respect that it is based for them on their religious beliefs in many cases. Uh, I do think that we do need to understand that in society there are people who have got different views on this issue. And I think probably uh, the position that we came to, which is to have a, 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 a statement from the public about where we should go on this issue in the form of a plebiscite, I think that that... You, that you is... rule out the idea of a referendum because, as I've just said earlier, the, oh, the Irish actually had a referendum yeah. um, when they were asked to add to the Constitution that marriage may be contracted in accordance with law by two persons without distinction as to their sex. Now, that's the kind of path that Scott Morrison would like you to go down. Um, you disagree? Well, well, I think in the case of Ireland, um, they needed to conduct a referendum to change their constitution because it was unclear whether their parliament could actually legislate for marriage. Now, that's not the case in relation to our constitution and our parliament. Section 5121 of our constitution, um, as has been, I think, very well articulated by our first <coughs> law officer, George Brandis, has said that we can, in fact, legislate to change the Marriage Act. Uh, and not only that, the High Court, as recently as two years ago, confirmed yeah. that the Parliament has, in fact, that power. So, so, so why, do you think, why do you think Scott Morrison is well, pushing so hard for a referendum? Well, well, I'm not sure that he's still pushing for that, frankly, because um, I think it's been made very clear by the Attorney-General, who is our first law officer of this nation, that, in fact, that's not required in order to change the Marriage Act. Okay. So a plebiscite, All right, I we, think, we, would got, be the right way to go. OK, thank Thank you. We've got more questions on yep. this, so I'm going to pause you Can there. Can I jump in? Yes, I want because you to I jump in. Because I was told <laughs> that Americans don't interrupt enough and that I would <coughs> jump in when I, you know... So, first I want to say, Jeannie, thank you for your question. I'm really grateful that you feel like you're able to speak up and share how you feel. Um, certainly that's not the case for a lot of kids with same-sex parents um, because this debate has been framed as one that is based on prejudice. And what that does is it shuts down <clears throat> a real robust debate and in our country, we really didn't have one. It was so demonized from the beginning that anybody that supported traditional marriage was doing so based on bias or bigotry or hatred or homophobia or something. And what it did is it totally shut it down and people felt like they could not speak up. And the truth is that while there are people with religious convictions, obviously, you know, members of your party feel that, you know, this is based on their, you know, deeply held religious beliefs. I think that our side needs to do a better job of making their case using natural law. And because I don't hold, I don't think that people should be accountable to my religion. I'm accountable to my religion. But all but, of us uh, are Katie, accountable can I just, to can I just, natural law, Katie, which governs our lives. So can I just interrupt yep. you there? Because you, you run a blog called Ask the Bigot, correct? Yes. <laughs> OK. Um, on the blog, you do spell out some of your own religious views yes. along these lines. True Christianity mm -hmm. will oppose the narrative that homosexuality is a positive and normal variation of human sexuality. Now, does that belief underpin your opposition to gay marriage? I had a lot to say when I started blogging. Some of it was to the public policy issue, and a lot of it was to churches that I feel like have not dealt with this issue well. I see a lot of churches in the United States <laughs> completely rolling over and just changing what their historical traditions have said in the past to fit the, the current cultural narrative. So that statement was for them. And our side now... So it's a statement of your belief or not? It's the belief that Christianity rejects that idea. And if they are going to hold fast to their traditions, then they need to be consistent. But when you are talking about public policy, scripture should not play a role in it. And okay. that our side needs to make convincing secular arguments using social science and natural law. Katie, our questioner, uh, in fact, the lady next to our questioner yeah. has her hand up. Go ahead. 
I'm Ginny's mother. Um, I'd like to dispute your assertion that your voices have been shut down. In fact, the Supreme, your US Supreme Court in the Obergefell case heard all the evidence. They heard submissions from you, yourself, and from a lot of other people, and they heard all the evidence, and they found that it is the banning of gay marriage which is causing ha harm and humiliation mm -hmm. to the children of same-sex couples. If you claim to speak for people like Ginny, if you claim to support her, why do you not support her right to have married parents? Mm. Thank you for the question. <laughs> so I'll say that there are organisations devoted to giving Ginny a voice. And there is nobody that gives a voice to kids that may express some misgivings about their upbringing. As a matter of fact, I was in Adelaide um, two days ago. And in a 24-hour period, I have two women come to me, two separately, one in person and one that approached me on Twitter, who said, this was my situation when I was young. I have never told anybody about it. Both one said, for 20 years, I've never shared how I felt. And the other one said, it has been 30 years since I left that house, and I never felt like I could talk to anybody. Because it seemed like everybody else had these glowing you know, household situations. And that didn't represent me. So on that flight home, I was sitting next to a woman who was from San Francisco. And we get into the chit chat, and she says, well, um, you know, what are you doing here? And I'm always like, well, you know, because, you know, Americans, and they can be a little crazy. And uh, I explained to her the connection between marriage and children's rights. And she said, you know, that's so fascinating. I've never heard that perspective before. I have never <coughs> considered that children's rights was connected to the marriage uh, issue at all. And so while a few of us were able to get briefs into the Supreme Court, the truth is that the American public has never really heard credible arguments on this issue from the other side because Katie, we've been uh, shut out of okay, media. Katie, uh, because there aren't any. <laughs> well, so let's talk about that. Can I, okay. let, uh, let Sam Dastiari wants to get in on this. I want to hear from the rest of our panel. So. Um, there is so much with what you've said just then that is, that is so offensive. It's hard, hard to know where to start. The, the politician <laughs> in me tells me that I should be saying that while I disagree with your views, I, I wholeheartedly respect them. But, but I find that very hard. I find it very hard to respect uh, a lot of your views and what you've said because I don't think it comes from a place of love. I think it comes from a place of hate. And I, I think that there is so much... You know, I can't accept the fact that you believe that Jeannie's parents, who I have I'm no doubt love each other, um, you know, that they're hurting their child simply because of the love they have for one another. I, I can't accept that. <clears throat> uh, I think so much... I think... I worry that so much of your views stem not really with an issue with just marriage. I think some of it stems from an issue with homosexuality. And you've described homosexuality as a lifestyle. You've, just, you've said that homosexuality drives us further away from God. Uh, these, are, these are your comments. You run a blog called Ask the Bigot. And I think that there are people in this country who have different views on same-sex marriage. They're entitled to have different views on same-sex marriage. Uh, people are going to have that debate but I think we have to have that debate at a higher level. And I'm sorry, but I think this American evangelical claptrap is the last thing we need in our debate. So before, before we come to the rest of the panel, I'm just going to go quickly, because there are other people in Australia who have different views uh, to yours, Sam, and we've got one person who's got a question, Jeremy Bell. We'll go to Jeremy. It's often said that if we change the law to recognise same-sex marriage, this will give same-sex couples what they want and it won't affect anyone else. I think that I speak for many supporters of traditional marriage when I say that what sets marriage apart from other loving relationships is that a man and a woman are capable of having children together, or at least normally they are, having as opposed to just raising them together. Now, existing marriage laws in Australia symbolically reaffirm this understanding, and reforming these laws would symbolically attack it. Is it not therefore fair to say that marriage equality, legalised marriage equality, would send a negative symbolic message to people who share this traditional understanding of marriage? OK, was well, so someone I haven't heard from on the panel yet, Brendan O'Neill? Um, well, here's what freaks me out about gay marriage. It presents itself as this kind of liberal, civil rights -y issue, but it has this really ugly, intolerant streak to it. Anyone who opposes gay marriage is demonised, harassed, 
Uh, we've seen people thrown out of their jobs because they criticise gay marriage. We've seen people uh, ejected from polite society. You know, 200 years ago, if you didn't believe in God, you wouldn't have a hope in hell of getting ahead in public life. Today, if you don't believe in gay marriage, you don't have a hope in hell of getting ahead in public life. There's a real ugly element to this. And I think, you know, you really see it with the whole cake shop phenomenon. This whole thing around the Western world where people are going to Christian traditional bake shop, cake shops and saying to them, hey, you stupid Christians make this cake for me and if they don't they call the police there are equality cases shops have closed down it's like a 21st century form of religious persecution it's horrendous and I think uh, you know it's of course some people support gay marriage as we've heard that's absolutely fine but what's extraordinary and unacceptable is that they cannot tolerate the existence of people who do not support gay marriage and I think we sometimes fail to understand how extraordinary that is. And I think the reason Tony Abbott is very defensive on this issue and is, is erming and ahhing and shifting from the free vote to the not free vote and all this stuff, he clearly has a problem with gay marriage. But he can't articulate it because we live in a climate in which it's not acceptable, as we've just seen in Sam's attack on Katie, calling her hateful and saying she's talking claptrap. It's not acceptable to express this sentiment in public well, life. No, and I think what's, what's... So, Tony Abbott... <laughs> Tony, Tony Abbott is now being described as someone from the Dark Ages for believing what humanity has believed for thousands of years. Within the space of a decade, something that humanity believed for thousands of years has suddenly become a form of bigotry, a form of hate, something you're not allowed to express in public life. That extraordinary shift in intolerance is something I think all liberals, like me, should be worried about. Gay marriage is not a liberal issue. It has a deeply illiberal streak. Um, I just want to get Kelly O'Dwyer to respond to that because... <clears throat> and go back to the question that we just heard because I, I think that actually does encapsulate what uh, probably the majority of your coalition party room pretty much thought, doesn't it? Well, well, to really understand it, you'd have to sit through a six-hour meeting, I think, <laughs> Tony. But, thanks, but, but no but, thanks. But, but look, um, I d look... I I actually accept uh, the view that you've just put, that we need to be tolerant of, of everyone's views. And I think, I think the idea that people are demonised for their very heartfelt, very sincere views is actually quite wrong. I have a very heartfelt and sincere view, which is in support of same-sex marriage, because, uh, like the question of Jeremy, I actually do believe that families are the bedrock of our society. I do believe it's important to do what we can to strengthen those families. And I think that marriage is one of those sacred institutions that sol solemnises commitment between uh, two people. And I think that that can only strengthen the family unit. And so, as a Liberal, I believe that um, anything that can strengthen the family unit is, is, in fact, a very good thing. So I support it. But I do also think that were we to make changes to the Marriage Act and put in there the fact that we do believe that people of same sex could, should be able to marry, we also need to have in there some protections for religious institutions, for those institutions that do, according to their own doctrinal beliefs, um, have a very sincere view that they don't wish to marry certain people, just as, as there, there are um, people today in religious institutions that won't, for instance, okay, marry okay. somebody who's not a confirmed Anglican or, or a Catholic. All right, we've got quite a few questions church. on this subject. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, the next question <coughs> is uh, from Connor Malanos. Uh, Katie Forst. Uh, first, I'd like to start by saying uh, I really respect you for holding your position strongly to yourself, even in the face of a lot of um, debate that comes about. Um, my question is, considering that scientific studies on homosexual and non-traditional marriage and its effect on children have found that children raised by two same-gender parents do as well, on average, as children raised by two different gender parents, on what, on what basis do you justify your claim that children have a right to have a relationship with their father and mother, and more specifically, only that combination of parents. Good. Thank you so much for the question. I think this is really important. Um, first of all, I make the basis of the claim that they have a right to the mother and father because it's one of the most self-evident rights out there, probably the mo only trumped by a parent's right to the child that they bear. So, and that's something that's recognized in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child that your country ratified in 1990. So it's it's widely accepted. Um, next, let's talk about the studies, because uh, this is critical. That, interestingly, whenever you are studying family structure, when you are not talking about same-sex parenting, social scientists tend to agree on three things. Number one, that 
Non-biological parents tend to be more transitory, invest less time and energy and resources into kids, and be more dangerous to kids. Uh, number two, they find that anytime trauma, a child loses a parent, that trauma is involved and that that can affect a child in the long term. And then they also agree that men and women parent differently and they offer distinct and complementary gifts to their kids. So whenever you're not talking about same-sex parenting, you're not studying same-sex households, social scientists agree on all of those three things. But suddenly, when you study same-sex households, even though all three of those are gonna be a factor every single time, suddenly children fare just as well. Now my question is, do you think that that could possibly be because those studies that show that there's no difference do not use random samples and that most of them derive their participants through recruited and volunteer studies? Katie, can I just uh, interrupt you? Because we do yeah. actually have uh, effectively a case study. It's a question that's come in from Craig Mack and let's hear Craig's story and then the others can comment on this as well. So, Katie, as a child, I grew up with my single drug-dealing junkie, sometimes hooker mother, in an environment that was surrounded by drugs, bikies, domestic violence, child abuse, drug overdoses, death, and police raids. Mm -hmm. I could roll the perfect joint at six, and so much more. At 15, I moved in with my gay uncle and his partner of 25 years. Mm -hmm. Only then did I experience a normal, stable, safe, structured environment that everybody else takes for granted. I've never understood the argument against marriage equality because of the potential damage to children. I'd be dead in jail or following, my, following in my mother's footsteps if it weren't for the two stable gay men who took me in. So my question to you is, as a child of two loving parents, can you explain the damage that that's done? And how are the risks any lesser with a straight couple? Good. Thank you, Craig. So, yeah. <laughs> So about 10 years ago, I was invited, maybe more, I was invited by two women to travel with them to adopt a child that had special needs um, in an overseas institution. And I said, heck yes, I'm going with you. And we, I know, so hateful, huh? Um, but I said, absolutely, right? That you are going to try and repair a damaged situation for a child. You're not inflicting motherlessness or fatherlessness on this child. Really, you are trying to repair something that has been lost, just like so many grandparents do and so many aunts and uncles do when the relationship between mother and father break down and that child is in need of some kind of rescue. And in that situation, I would say that adoption agencies need to have all options on the table because you're trying to repair a broken situation. But what we don't want is a system or a family structure that permits intentional fatherless and motherlessness. And because government's interest in marriage is children, it's not how you feel about somebody. Government's interest in marriage is children. And so redefining marriage redefines parenthood into an institution where mothers and fathers are not necessary and they're optional. And that's really not the case in the life of a child. When a child loses a parent, the ones I've talked to, they tend to mourn the loss of that parent. So while I absolutely would say we gotta get in and do life with couples that are doing their best to help a child in a broken situation, that's very different than institutionalize a, institutionalizing a family structure okay, where Katie, children I'm, will I'm, always I'm, lose one or the I'm, other. I'm sorry to draw you to a conclusion yeah, on that point, you. but I wanna hear from the other panelists. Yeah. Richard Dinatale. Well, I suppose I'm a little concerned that we've gone from equal marriage, which is a very different debate to parenting, and um, let's accept the... <laughs> I mean, we, we don't have, we, we support and we, as a society the right of same-sex couples to, to be parents. And we do it because, look, there's lots of pseudoscience and gobbledygook out there about the effects on kids. Almost every study demonstrates that um, the most important factor is whether a child is um, raised in a loving household. That's and actually your, not your, what the your studies study, say, though. Your, your, your case study demonstrates that. It's not biology that... Uh, influences whether you've got a happy, healthy, well-balanced child. It's whether they grow up in a loving household. And if there's any uh, issue that kids growing up in an environment with same-sex uh, parents have to face, it's the discrimination towards their parents. And it's that issue that we should be tackling. Not this nonsense argument about whether um, people of the same sex should be able to raise a child. I mean, that, we've had that debate. That's gone. We're now having a debate around marriage and whether people should be able to marry. And 
Look, Brendan, your issue of... You know, this is a straw man that suddenly all these advocates are out there waiting to storm cake shops because they support it's gay okay. marriage. It's nonsense. <laughs> and, and, of course, you've, I accept we're in a pluralist society and you have to accept that people have different views. But you should also be prepared to name it. And the issue with marriage is this for me. Marriage is an expression of love and commitment between two people. That's what it is. Now, why do we say that one couple should be entitled to express that love and commitment publicly and yet another couple can't do that? The only justification for that is that you think that the love between those people is somehow lesser, it's worth less, it's not as important and it's different. And that's what prejudice is. OK, I'm just going to... Br Br Brendan O'Neill's <laughs> chopping at the bit here. I'm just going to bring him in. Brendan, keep your answer, keep your, uh, keep it short. Okay. Right. To, to you, to you, marriage is about two people getting together. To other people, it's different. To other people, it's about starting a family. It's about um, socialising the next generation. And they it's can still do that. It's, they can do it's that. about becoming part no of the community. Them from my problem, the my problem with the gay marriage debate is that it actually increases the state's oversight of family life rather than decreasing it. So the presentation of this as a liberal issue is completely facetious. This is about the state having the right to redefine the moral meaning of marriage. Now, the modern state brokers marriage. We know that. It brokers it. It gives you a certificate. It says you're married. Thumbs up. Well done. This gives the state the right to redefine the moral meaning of marriage, which has been an organic thing developed over thousands of years. For me, as a libertarian, that's a step too far. And I think for you to redefine a view that was standard for thousands of years as bigotry, that in itself is a form of bigotry. Because what you're saying is that you will not tolerate traditionalists. You will not tolerate religious no. people. You we will not tolerate There was a time Christians. women couldn't vote. You there was a time women couldn't you vote. Will We've not moved on. Right, in the space of... OK, hang on, hang on. Sam Dessiari wants to get in. Please go ahead. Brendan, where I was born... Where I was born in Iran, you know, marriage is a contract or agreement between one... exclusively between one man and up to four women. I mean, there are different standards, there are different rules, and but frankly... But opposite and, sexes. And, Yes, obviously. This is sexes. what's new. So why but, will you not admit the newness of this institution? Brendan, why do you pretend Brendan, that it's Brendan, the same the as the other institution me, that has existed for, for thousands of years? So, so not... discrimination's uh, only an issue if it's entrenched for decades? I don't understand oh, it. Hang on, hang on. We, we need, we need some... We, we, so we need, not, we need look, people accept, to be able to finish their points. I Go ahead. I accept that this is an idea that has been debated and brought into the public space more recently. That is definitely correct. That doesn't mean it's wrong. This is about love. It's about equality. It's What's a fundamental wrong? human What's right. What's wrong is the silencing, the sacking of people, the demonisation of people, the harassment of people who have a different view. Gay What's marriage panel, activists, gay marriage activists compare... A, com you've got they a voice. Compare, you've got your own blog. They compare I mean, themselves... <laughs> talking about they, hold on, the hold on. They compare themselves to Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King said, we do not hate our enemies, we love them. The exact... Opposite is the case of okay, all right. Thank you, the Brendan. Exact opposite. All right, now, Katie, I'm, I'm going to give you the final word here because a lot has been said about your views. And can I just mm -hmm. put it to you as a question? Um, obviously, right now, uh, gay couples can adopt children and they can have children and they can bring them up. How does the marriage equation change that? Well, you know, some of you have said there's no good reason, right? There's no good reason except hatred. And I guess I would ask you to consider this from a child's point of view, that um, not every couple has children. Every child has a mother and father. And every child has a right to that mother and father, a natural right. And d despite what you may say, social science doesn't just say nice people um, determine best outcomes for kids. The reality is that the married mother-father household determines the best outcome, the outcome for kids. That's rubbish. Oh, my. That's rubbish. Rubbish. That's um, but it's actually not, and yeah, that is. social science has been studying Edith alternative Cowan family structures for about... It's hateful, you know, it's prejudice. Right, oh, right. It's, it's not that it stems from biology. No, it's just wrong. It's, it's just wrong. <laughs> well, it's not wrong. And it's, we know that it's not wrong because when kids lose a relationship with a parent, they really tend to suffer. I think most of us can look at our childhoods and say, that hurt. When I lost a parent, that hurt. And so we don't want to inflict intentional motherlessness and fatherlessness on kids in the name of progress. All right, OK, I'm sorry, because we've got a lot of other questions to come to. We're going to have to draw a line under this at some point. We probably should do it now. You're watching Q&A, where we <laughs> encourage our panellists to express their opinions, but stick to the facts. So if you hear any dodgy claims on Q&A, send a tweet using the hashtags factcheck and uh, quanda. 
Uh, last week's tweets generated a fact check on penalty rates by The Conversation. Keep an eye on our Twitter account for future fact checks. Mm. Well, the next question is a video. It's from Andrew Tran in Perth. Good evening, Senator. Would you please explain the difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance? And when you say there's huge amounts of profits shifting outside of Australia by these companies, where do those companies sit on that spectrum? And if you're saying they're sitting more towards the tax evasion end, then are you saying the Australian Taxation Office has not been performing its compliance functions properly? Sam Dastiari. Uh, thank you. And I've actually, uh, Andrew Tran's a great blogger and he does a lot of stuff on this issue out of Perth. I've seen his tweets and that and he writes quite a bit about it. So it's nice to actually put a face to the, uh, to the tweets. Um, look, the point that he's, I think, getting at and I think is the right point is a lot of what's gone on is legal. The difference when we're talking about evasion and avoidance, you know, evasion is a crime, evasion is breaking the law, uh, avoidance is when you start talking about the more kind of pointy end and then you've got tax minimisation there as well, which is clearly within the law. The point I think he's making and, and it, is that so much of these practices, so much of what goes on is completely legal and that is part of why we have to be so vigorous in actually fighting this. You ask about where it all goes, I'll give you one example. I'm going to give you the example of an iPad. An iPad retails for about $700 when you buy it down the road at the Apple shop. When you buy an iPad, you're buying it from Apple Australia. Apple Australia is buying that iPad through a whole bunch of other transactions, ultimately from Apple Island. Apple Island's goal is to sell that iPad to Apple Australia for as close to $700 as possible, so there's barely any profit made in Australia, and all the profit is artificially made overseas. The joke in all this is that the iPad itself is actually made in China and is mailed, sent straight from the factory in China to the Australian store who sells it to you, but somehow the bulk of this transaction took place in Ireland. That's what's going on at the moment, and there are huge amounts of money, and I think there is more that all governments can and should be doing in this space. And, uh, and again, I, I will uh, acknowledge that, I mean, uh, Kelly's here as well from the government. Uh, the Treasurer has said some really good things about this. Uh, there have been some measures from the government. I think there is a lot more that can and should be done on this. And frankly, I think that's where we'll be pushing for through the Senate, through whatever means are available. Um, Sam, is one means available to leak the report of the Senate inquiry? Uh, because it looks like yeah, you might be is... in some trouble oh, over look, that. Look, really good. Look, sorry. Uh, this is something that the government's been kind of uh, running around with and, of course, I, I didn't and I wouldn't. Um, but, look, what we need in this space is a lot more transparency. We need a lot more facts out there. We need a lot more information. We need a lot more whistleblowing. We need to make sure that we have people out there actually talking about what's going on because the enormity of this... And, you know, one of the big ideas, and, and again, this wasn't the question, but I'll take the opportunity to talk about it, uh, is, well, you have to keep it very brief if you're going to go off question. There's a lot more transparency, and a big part of that, I think, is naming and shaming some of Australia's worst tax offenders. Well, Kelly O'Dwyer. Well, um, I'll What's let... What's wrong with naming and shaming, I'll, by the way? I'll, well, firstly, I'll let Sam explain his position to the Privileges Committee in, in terms of what's happened with this report. I do think it's important that we do make sure that those who earn profits in Australia pay tax in Australia. I mean, it's like saying we're in favour of motherhood, of course. Everybody wants to see our multinationals pay their fair share of tax. And what the Australian government has done is it has led... I mean, I'm more interested, rather than in show trials, I'm more interested in the substance of what it is that we can actually do to make sure that people do pay their fair share of tax. Joe Hockey has been an international leader when it comes to this. Our presidency of the G20 led to us putting in place arrangements with other countries so that we would be able to properly measure the tax that is paid in those countries, that we would have country by country reporting to our Australian Taxation Office. We have also put forward some legislation that's going to be coming into the Parliament very shortly, legislation that changes Part 4 of the Tax Act, which is going to mean that instead of the, um, the sole purpose test, it's a principal purpose test, so that those people who are seeking to profit shift or transfer price out of the country are not going to be able to get away with it because our Australian Taxation Office will more easily be able to come after them. And we have increased the resources available to the Australian Taxation Office so you must know you must know at this point, do you, areas. how much tax has, is being avoided 
Do you have well, a clear picture of that? It's, it's, it is very unclear to, to understand exactly how much tax is being avoided, which is why it is that we need to look at this from an international perspective and also take measures domestically as well, which is what I was talking about. So, so you're not sure do... at this point, the Treasury um, and the tax officials are not sure it's... how much you could actually reap back or take back from well, the unpaid billions. It's, it's, right? very, it's very hard to model because, of course, when you change laws as well, you also potentially change behaviour. And, and the Labor, you know, the Labor Party would like to sort of proclaim that, you know, they've got some magic figure that they can come up with and if only we make this change, which, by the way, they didn't do during their six years in government, if only we make this change that somehow this is going to solve, you know, the, 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 the debt problem that they got us into in such a short period of time. Well, well in fact, it's not. There is not one magic solution here. Uh, we need to be much more sophisticated about this. We need to work with international partners. And also, we need to make sure that when we catch people, the penalties are harsh. Okay, and that's and, why we're and, doubling and very briefly, just, just to pick up his point earlier, um, there are the dirty 30, I think they call them, the, the, the multinationals that had tax officials set in there. Why yeah. can't the public know who they are? So the Australian Taxation Office, um, under the Treasurer Joe Hockey, has actually sent tax officials into 30 major multinational companies to try and understand mm, yes, at a so, grassroots so level why, exactly, why, why can't they they exactly what why is going on. Why can't we know who they are? Well, because in th this idea Why can't of... consumers know? Why can't we give the power back to the people? When, you, when you're done, I mean, this idea of name and shame, um, Sam, does nothing to actually bring an extra dollar through the door. Legislation and international agreements and resourcing our Australian Taxation Office properly, that is what is okay. going to bring money through all the right. door. All right. Now, now, there are other panellists. Brief. Keep it brief, because we've um, got a few questions. Yeah, what's with all this naming and shaming? When did politics become so medieval? It's like everywhere you go, someone is naming and shaming on Twitter, in, in the political sphere, in the media. It reminds me of being back at convent school when the nuns were always shaming someone for wearing makeup or trainers or whatever it was in my mind this chasing this moralistic witch hunt off people who don't pay enough tax is actually a displacement activity from talking about the economic problems that are faced across the western world we're talking it's, can i just kind of make the point here that um we're talking here about multinational yeah multi of course not, of not course. individuals the, no not, but of yeah. course and it, the same thing is happening in britain across europe and also to a certain extent in america there's this idea that these people these conglomerates these corporations these companies are evil we have to hunt them down we have to name them shame them we have to embarrass them it's a moralistic displacement activity from talking about the real problems which mm -hmm. face the western world which is a lack of economic creativity a lack of wealth creation and instead you obsess over how you can shift wealth that already exists from over here to over here. It's about avoiding a serious discussion about economic okay. stasis. And it's, right. it's highly moralistic and quite medieval in the language okay. that's used. Richard Dinatelli. Right, <laughs> where to start? Um, <laughs> there's $400 billion of money going offshore, $60 billion of it going into tax havens, and we're having a debate around the GST and whether people should be slugged more for a loaf of bread, mainly a, a, a tax that impacts most on poor people, of course people who are earning mega profits here in Australia should pay their fair share. And that's, there's nothing moral about it, it's just it's a decent thing and it's, and it's what the country needs if we're to deal with some of our revenue issues. Now, I have to say, I'm, I have to give credit to Christine Milne because she set up yeah. this inquiry and we're having this debate yeah. now nationally because of the work that she did in the area. Um, Kelly talks about um, the ATO and giving them more resources. Well, we've gutted the ATO. There have been hundreds of jobs slashed from the Australian Taxation Office. So now, the way these guys pay their tax is they sit in there with their lawyers, having a negotiation with a completely debilitated um, taxation office, and they negotiate what level of tax they, they want to pay. I mean, imagine going to your accountant and saying, well, you know what, I think I pay too much tax. Let's negotiate how much I can pay. So we've got to resource the Australian Taxation Office. The idea of it's, it's not naming and shaming. It's just getting yes, it is. some That's transparency. What That's what he described. No, well, it he as. described it in that way. I don't describe it in that way. It's ensuring that these companies are publish detailed financial accounts, or else, so that we know, well, so that we know, or else they'll be named so, and shamed. But but how can it be fair? It's naming and shaming. It's not naming and shaming. It's it's actually transparency and information. As a <laughs> as a libertarian and somebody who believes in market economics. Surely okay. asymmetry of information is something you're, you're concerned about. 
And this is what we've got here. We've okay, got hang on. So, uh, Sam Destiari wants to jump in. I'm going to let him do that I briefly. Think this, briefly. First, firstly, I think Christine Millen does need to be acknowledged for the work she did in the Senate 25 year career and uh, on this in, on this space. Look. This is about transparency and it's about making sure Australian consumers have more information. I think it's needed for two things. Firstly, to allow them to make better choices in how they want to spend their money. And secondly, I think it drives better policy when there is more information out there for the Australian public um, to actually be more informed in what's going on. The practices, the techniques, what is going on behind these closed doors in these companies when it comes to tax is shocking and we deserve to have more information out there in the public space. Okay, we've got another question. Uh, it's actually aimed at Richard Dinatale. He can answer it probably on his own. It's from Jim uh, Wilkinson. Go ahead. Uh, Senator, there is a generally held view that your party is financially naive and lacks economic credibility. You cannot rely solely on bleeding the wealthy any more than the government could last year by hitting the needy. Um, you know, naming and shaming, as someone has just said, will not bring in any, do in any dollars. It's all good local politics, but that's all it is. Increasing the rate of GST must be a central part of any solution, and if done properly, it need not be regressive. Will you, Senator, show political and financial leadership by working with a future government to repair our revenue base by increasing the rate of GST? Thanks for the question. Thanks for the question. I'm, and I'm um, no, really pleased to be able to answer that. Uh, we've been tackling the issue of revenue head on. We, we released a policy into negative gearing, which we think um, is an important reform. We'll bring in $40 billion over the next decade. We think the concessions around superannuation need to be addressed, and we've taken that issue head on. I think multinational tax avoidance is a big issue, uh, and it is on the revenue side of the ledger. Um, I think that you do those things before you start increasing something like a consumption tax. You've got to deal with those issues first. They are huge distortions in the market. Now, if we talk broadly about what the economic future for this country looks like, we've got a government that has hitched its prosperity on a business model that's failing. We've got a government that has said that it's committed to coal, to coal exports, when the market is telling us that it's an industry on the way out. We've got an India no longer buying our coal. We've got the market in Japan flattening. We've got China, who are no longer... I don't think longer... it's true that India is no longer no. buying our coal. Chi I think you must have that They wrong. want to. No, in India, India, in the next decade... It's about to decade, build one of the biggest mines India in India in the next decade have made a statement that they will no longer buy not a kilo of Australian coal. They will be out of the coal business uh, as far as Australian imports is concerned in the next decade. They're on the record of saying that. And so we have, we have a choice. You can continue to rely on those industries of the last century, or you can have a jobs-rich, pollution-free uh, future based on renewables, on high-tech industries, on increasing investment in science, in research, in innovation. That's where the future of this country lies. It relies on those industries where we can make the most advantage of the great human capital we've got in this country. We're not going to continue to build our prosperity simply on minerals and resources. And we are the only party, the only party who's prepared to chart a vision on that 21st century modern economy. Okay, all right. <laughs> Kelly, Kelly O'Dwyer, I'll, I'll bring you in. And um, well, let's go back to the question, which is about the GST. And uh, now that the New South Wales Premier has billed the cat, um, are you prepared to jump in and defend raising the GST? Well, well first, uh, uh, the question actually asked a question of the Greens. When are you mm. actually going to be fiscally responsible, economically responsible? Yes, but the question was about heard, the well, GST, well, so I'm just me, interested in your I, view I'll, on that. I'll come straight to that, but, but let me just say this, because what I heard Richard say was that they have a whole host of new scenarios to dream up new taxes. Costed they would by like the parliamentary to, budget they would office. Like to, Fully well, costed. You don't, except you don't Fully release costed. the modelling. But, but, but they see a scenario where we're just going to tax our way um, into prosperity. Now, they never, ever talk about containing spending, ever. No, that's not they true. Never talk that's about just it. not true, well, Kelly. Well, I wrote... Let, let, let me give you an well, example. Uh, please. Uh, the new health minister, Minister Lee, the first thing I said to Minister Lee was this. If you want to rein in health spending, don't slug uh, patients a, a Medicare co-payment. That's the wrong way to do it. There's a lot of inefficient spending in health care. We spend a lot of money on interventions that don't work, that aren't good for people. Let's look at reining that in. 
And in fact, to her credit, she's established a task force that does that. OK, that's, all right. That's a okay. Now, okay. Well, Kelly O'Dwyer, well, can, I, 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 can I bring you to the, the core of the question that was raised there? And, uh, I mean, the GST is a tax, as I recall, and the New South Wales Premier has <laughs> raised a debate as to whether the, that tax needs to go up to pay for the things that you need to spend <clears> money on, like health and education. So... That debate has started. It's been embraced by your government. Do you think the GST should go up? Well, what we've said is that if the state premiers want to make the argument that they need more money in order to spend it on particular services that they say people are demanding, then they need to make that argument. You're not going to see an increase in the GST without the agreement of all of the state premiers. And already, state premiers have come out to say that they are not going to support the increase of GST. When you increase the GST, by the way, you're not actually but giving $1 they... to, to the Commonwealth. It goes directly to the states. So it is for the states... To pay to for make... health well, and it's education. To, it's for the states, though, to make that argument. You need... This is part of the reason we've got the Federation so White it, Paper, is, is to it, try and Can I just ask a quick question? The, really, the, the, que revenue. the question I've got for you is, why wait for the leadership to come from people like the New South Wales Premier? Why not lead from the centre? Well, well we're doing, we are leading by having both a Federation debate and a tax debate where we're saying that there does okay. need to be a connection between those that are spending the money and those that are collecting the money. At the moment, there's a huge disconnect right. in our Federation system. OK, we've got to go on to other questions. The next one's from Sam Young. Uh, there's been some talk recently <clears throat> about targets for female politicians, particularly in the Liberal Party. Um, but what's next? You'll have targets for black people, targets for gay people... Targets for disabled people. I don't think we need to label people like that. Um, what happened to just picking people based on merit alone rather than on gender or race or anything like that? Let's start with Brendan O'Neill, who's written about this. Uh, yeah, I think targets or quotas or anything for women in politics is a terrible idea because those women will never know for sure whether they were selected on the basis of merit or on the basis of their biology. And I think, you know, you, when you hear people like Kelly saying earlier this week or last week, I think... Um, you know, women need help in Parliament to have the confidence to raise their hand and ask a question. It's like you're talking about school children. These are adults. These are autonomous adults who have... That. It's in your ABC interview. Yeah. It's, it's these, these are autonomous adults. They have freedom. No. They have autonomy. And the, the, the problem is that women are being <coughs> infantilised by this process. So much of modern feminism actually infantilises women by treating them as incapable of negotiating public life on their own without the assistance of the government or targets and so on. And the thing I find really obnoxious about this discussion is the idea that women make politics more consensual and more conciliatory and more friendly. And what you have is the rehabilitation of the old prejudice that this is the fairer sex, that they're mothering, that they're caring. My political heroines are not, were not consensual. Bernadette Devlin, the MP for Mid-Ulster in the 1970s, who strode across the House of Commons and punched the Home Secretary in the <laughs> face when he lied about Bloody Sunday. She wasn't consensual. This idea that women are more consensual than men, more caring, more, more motherly, is actually, in a PC form, it rehabilitates an old prejudice. I think we need to let women go, let them run with, on their own, and they will make it on their own. Okay, They're not right. children, think, they are I, okay, adults. OK, Brendan, I think you've made that point. Let's hear from Kelly O'Dwyer, well, and I well, want to hear from the other panellists as well. I, I mean, <coughs> I, I are you would, feeling conciliatory? I, I would recommend, well, <laughs> you know, I would recommend that you read my, my interview in full. I, I, I don't think you've paraphrased it very accurately at all. Um, but, but the point I would make is I think it is actually important that in the Parliament, the Parliament reflect our population and our diversity. And our, our parliament um, does not reflect our society. 50% um, and more of our society is actually women, and we don't see that reflected in the parliament. Now, all I'm simply saying is not that you don't pre-select women based on merit, that you don't pre-select people based on merit. In fact, you know, of course, you've got to get the right people for the job. What I'm simply saying is that we do need to acknowledge that particularly you know, in my party, and I've spoken about my party, the others can talk about their own parties here, but, but we do need to see more women in the parliament and that only by having a target can you actually measure your progress. 
We're not, we're not saying it's a quota, that it's defined. We, we don't have the sort of system in the Liberal Party which says that factional warlords can determine who should be pre-selected for a particular seat. That's the Labor Party. In the Liberal Party, we have a grassroots organisation. And what I'm simply suggesting is that yeah. together with you know, other female colleagues of mine, okay. like Linda Reynolds... Kelly, we're, 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 um, we're, so, I'm sorry about this. We're rapidly running out of time. I'd like to hear Katie, the other woman on the panel. I just it. think it's fascinating. Um, that you guys feel that um, women make a difference and that it's helpful to have both perspectives and that certainly that can bring about a more balanced party and certainly it does represent, you know, half of the population. And I guess that you might agree that, that the gender balance matters in the life of a child too. <laughs> right? No, really. And I think that it was your um, senator, Erica Betts, he said, marriage is the only institution that's gotten the gender balance right. And he's right. You're not proposing setting targets, said it, it's got to be right. Um, <laughs> Sam Dastyari. Um, uh, look, I, I think the part of... Uh, I think Bill Short and our party leader has been very strong on this issue and been quite outspoken and uh, came out of the LP conference and said that we do want to have a party that is able to achieve 50% uh, of women in the federal parliament. The problem is that the political system and political parties, and major political parties in particular, uh, were created, especially in the case of the Labor Party, 120 years ago uh, by a group of white men uh, and so much of the structure and how it's been created and the culture of these organisations reflect that. And the challenge is how do you break out of that? How do you, how do you actually become a party that creates an environment that is able to attract uh, a, a variety of different views and a variety of kind of uh, uh, women and, and not just female diversity but also ethnic diversity as well. And look, you fundamentally do have a problem in a system where we have a federal cabinet which for a year and a half only had one woman and now has two women, I think there is a problem within a system. And I don't think it's just about Labor or Liberal. I think the Labor Party does do it better than the Liberal Party. But this is a problem for society as a whole. Richard. Oh, look, um, Sam's right. I I'm really proud to lead a party that's um, a majority of women in our party room. And if you look now in some of our states, in Tassie, we're an all-women party. Um, we have five out of se seven women in Victoria. I think it's because of the culture we have. It's a very healthy culture and it supports women right from the moment they join the party right through to when they become members of parliament. The Liberal Party have a major problem um, and good on Kelly for taking it on and naming it. It is a big problem. I mean, Brendan, uh, you have to change things. You have to change the culture and the institution if you're going to get more women in parliament. It doesn't just happen magically. You know, the front bench say that they... Uh, I think it was Tony Abbott said that his front bench was selected on merit. Now, I've worked very closely with some of that front bench and I can tell you that merit was the last thing that got most of them there. <laughs> um, and, and they need... You're going to have to wind up where out of Yeah, time. well, I think, I think having more women in the, uh, in the Liberal Party room could only be a change for the better. And uh, we'll pray that's all we have time for tonight. I'd love to come back <laughs> to some of our panellists on that, but it's all we have time for. Please thank our panel, Brendan O'Neill, Kelly O'Dwyer, Richard Di Natale, Cathy Faust and Sam Dustiari. Thank you very much. And next Monday on Q&A, we'll head to the Melbourne Writers Festival to talk political writing uh, with three former politicians who went into print. Senior Howard Cabinet Minister Peter Reith, former Queensland Premier Anna Bly, rural independent Tony Windsor. Will he come back into politics? And the Australian publisher who breathed new life into political writing, Louise Adler. Um, are political memoirs the inside story or just one last chance to spin? Until next week's Q&A, good night.